and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website, podcastufo.com. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we have a great show for you tonight with guest David Marler on triangular UFOs and a lot more. And I've been trying to get Dave on for quite some time, and I'm really excited about this. Well, Alejandro Rojas is in Las Vegas this week, so there's no UFO news from him. And I kind of feel like the stay-at-home mom while hubby is uh, doing whatever, who knows what, in Vegas. So I decided to cheat on him and bring in Ryan Sprague. He's going to be talking in a few minutes about his first FOIA experience. And before that, I want to say, um, after throwing wads of bills into people's foreheads of the tech people over at HostGator, I finally got my email working. That's since January. So it's finally reactivated and working just fine, and I have a slew of responding to catch up on. I apologize if you wrote me a while ago and I didn't respond. Thank you to the supporters that are helping out with the show. And I'll be traveling to Maryland this weekend to spend a couple of days with longtime researcher Ray Stanford, who's going to be going over all kinds of UFO evidence with me. At uh, some point, we're going to be doing some pre-recording for next week's show. So that's right, next week's show is not live, but I'll be in the chat room uh, during the live show. Speaking of chat room, you can go in there and uh, if you're listening live now, and just go over to podcastufo.com, and it's our easy one-two click sign-in. Again, I want to thank supporters um, for just l- as little as a dollar a month. You can help support us and listen to the full show, the second part of the show. And here's another quick shout out: we have a lot of five-dollar a month or more supporters. Todd L, thank you. John S, Mark P, Jeremy Z, Linda C, Robin D, Bill E, and uh, there'll be more. Next week, so it's time to bring in Ryan Sprague. How are you, Ryan? I'm doing great, Martin. I'm uh, so happy to be here and uh, be the one that you are cheating on with Alejandro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yes, I'm uh, You came up on the show a couple of times. We also debunked uh, one of your Ap- or your April Fool's jokes, so that was oh, good. Yeah, yes, yeah. that was a uh, a fun experience. I thought it would be a funny joke, and it turned out to be the biggest. Facebook post I've ever had, so that <laughs> that tells you something right there. <laughs> you used all the right keywords. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So why don't you tell us what's going on with this uh, FOIA? You finally received a paper. You did. I, I know a lot of people have these experiences, but it's always um, it's always interesting to hear about the process and what you found out. Yeah, um, I had been following the work of uh, John Greenwald for a really long time, Martin, um, over at the Black Vault, where. This guy's got over a million declassified documents pertaining to, you know, UFOs, uh, national security, uh, conspiracy theories. It's incredible. And uh, sort of took a uh, catapult from that and looked into the one of the most intriguing cases, in my opinion, the 1976 Tehran UFO incident. Mm-hmm. Um, so... You know, John, I had spoken to at the uh, UFO Congress last year, and he said, if you're going to request these things for an FOIA, you have to be as specific as possible. If if you do not specifically request something, uh, they're not going to give it to you. They don't have the time. They don't have the wherewithal. And frankly, they don't care. So unless you are super specific about what you are looking for and the specific documents, uh, they're not going to send it to you. So it took me a while to sort of gather all the information on this case and see what I was looking for. Um, and I, I was able to get from the Defense Intelligence Agency all the documents that they had on the case. Uh, this spanned over 10 pages detailing the incident reported by both the NSA, the CIA, and the Defense Intelligence Agency. I was 
very surprised to say the least. Uh, and yeah, it was um, took a while, as these things always do. But how long did it take? Uh, it took about, I would say, five months or so for me to just get a response from them. And that wasn't even uh, in reference to the documents themselves. That took another two or three months. But, you know, in their official letter to me, they, they apologized for such a backlog. And, uh, yeah, with these sort of things, Martin, you have to be very patient because they get these requests all the time. And... Just like any government agency, they always have, you know, one person doing these things, especially when it comes to the mm-hmm. UFO topic. So we should be lucky that we're getting anything, I guess. <laughs> now, uh, do they treat, as far as you know, do they treat anyone any differently than anyone else, or is everyone treated equally? I would say everyone is treated equally. Again, it has to do with how you request these things. You can't go to the DIA, the CIA, anything like that and say, I want information about UFOs or I want your information on Roswell. These are things that they will immediately shrug off and your request will be put in the garbage. You Mm -hmm. have to show that you have put time and effort into this to get your your request answered. Uh, So again, being as specific as you can about dates, people involved, uh, you know, certain agencies that perhaps documented the case. Uh, these are things that they're looking for that, so that they have to do the least amount of work to, uh, to give this back to you. So, yeah, as long as you are detailed and specific, uh, they will treat you just the same as anyone else requesting. Now, was any part of these uh, 10 pages redacted at all? Uh, There were certain things redacted, uh, such as specific names, uh, pilots involved. But other than that, the key players, key witnesses involved in the case were all still there and have also gone on the record. So right there, I think that's why those certain things were not redacted. Now, did you learn anything that you didn't know already by looking through these documents? That's a great question. Uh, A lot of people have asked me, was there any new information? This case has been available through the FOIA for a while now, Um, but it was very exciting for me to actually get official documentation on it. Um, Now you're on on the FBI NSA's watch list. Exactly. (laughs) I know. As soon as I got that letter back, I, I, I told my friends, yep, there we go. I'm in. I've made it in. Uh, Yeah. But yeah, I think what what struck me the most was certain quotations by the witnesses involved uh, that were in the documents. This was a heavily reported and documented case and uh, extremely fascinating. And this was an encounter. I mean, these pilots, their instruments failed when they got close to these objects. And they were quote-unquote attacked by the object. So for the listener who has not heard about this specific case. Can you just go over that in a nutshell, just briefly? Of course. Uh, The Tehran incident happened, Martin, September 19th of 1976. uh, And this was in the city of Tehran in Iran. And uh, this was witnessed by the Imperial Iranian Air Force. They got reports of lights being seen in the sky. So they thought it would be Venus or, you know, the, the... quintessential swamp gas. So they sent an F-4 fighter up to investigate. And uh, when they got up there, they they noticed that this was an actual solid diamond-shaped object that was actually breaking off into several other objects that would come close to the pilot. The pilot then landed, reported what he saw, and then they sent up more fighter jets to, to investigate. And when the fighter pilots got closer to the object, all of their instruments failed. So at that point, you know, what could they do? They had to land and uh, figure out how, you know, how to approach this thing. Uh, An investigation was done afterwards, both by the Iranian Air Force and the U.S. government. And uh, very, very fascinating. I would definitely urge people to look further into it. Uh, There's many TV shows that have included this event but Mm -hmm. for all of that information i suggest going to either the article that i wrote or to john greenwald's black vault website and to see the documents firsthand now what's uh what's the name of your blog uh my blog is somewhere in the skies.com yeah i like that great name well (laughs) hey 
Thanks so much, and I hope uh, Alejandro's jealous. Uh, that would make my day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you soon, Ryan. So hang in there, everyone. We'll be right back after the music break with David Marler on Triangular UFOs. that tune was by Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse. And, you know, I played that on mono. I apologize. It doesn't sound near as good. And David Marler, how are you? Uh, I am doing quite well. Thank you. Did you forget to unmute your mic? <laughs> uh, I don't know. There's a little lag in the computer. <laughs> okay. Hey, David, I'm real excited to have you on the show. And I've heard your name for quite a while, nothing but good. Um, I listened to interviews with you, and I'm just real excited. And everyone is on the chat board as well. So we'll be having some questions come in. If you haven't jumped in the chat room and listening live, go to podcastufo.com, and right on the sidebar, it's just two clicks and you're in. And uh, so the first hour, we're going to be talking about all types of triangle UFOs, obscure Etc. In the second hour, we're going to be talking about a new project you're working on. Plus, we're going to be talking about the January 5th, 2000 sighting that involved police officers, a real fascinating uh, sighting I've heard about for a number of years, and I can't wait to talk about that as well. So for the person who doesn't know who David Marler is, can you go ahead and say who you are, your background and all that, if you would, please? Sure. Uh, well, I've been actively involved in the UFO field now for about 25 years. Uh, always had an interest, even as a, a child growing up in the uh, early 70s. And uh, my interest was initially peaked back in 1973 during a wave of UFO sightings in and around the vicinity of a small town called Piedmont, Missouri. And uh, that was what initially piqued my interest because I had family and uh, friends that lived down there at the time. And so that was my initial introduction at the age of five years old to the UFO subject. But uh, in 1990, I uh, became involved with uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and uh, later became state director. And uh, over the years in doing investigations, I was slowly amassing a very large uh, private library of UFO books, journals, newspapers, news clippings, audio recordings, etc., and, uh, you know, have one of the larger private collections on the subject. And, and much of the material that I wrote about in my book uh, was derived from many of these news clippings, many of these obscure private newspapers published, you know, anywhere between the 1940s all the way up into the present day. Wow. Wow. Um, and what, what, uh, what started you in the particular interest of triangle UFOs? Well, my initial introduction, like many uh, here in the United States, was the uh, initial cover stories being published in the uh, MUFON Journal at the time. And uh, this was, like I said, in 1990 and into 1991. And, of course, the Belgian wave of these large triangular UFOs mm -hmm. started in uh, November of 1989 and stretched all the way into the spring of 1991. And just purely uh, as an academic, uh, just reading about these reports, uh, I was fascinated by a couple different things, Martin. 
One, as I'm sure you can appreciate, was just the sheer scale of what was being reported. You know, historically, we hear these reports of these 20, 30 foot diameter flying saucers or flying discs. So, you know, what these uh, military and law enforcement officers and citizenry over in Belgium were describing were, you know, 300 foot long, dark triangular objects not flitting about in the sky so much, but, you know, cavorting very slowly at low altitude over the treetops and um, virtually silent, if not completely silent. So it was a departure from that classic imagery, that, that, that iconography we have of the, the silver flying saucer zipping about in the sky. And coupled with that, I was amazed with the way in which the Belgian military was not only investigating the reports, but very willingly sharing their their findings, their investigative findings with the general public. So it was a, a huge departure from what we're used to here in the United States with military officials regarding the UFO subject. Right. I had the pleasure of talking to and meeting uh, General De Brouwer. Um, yes. What a, what a nice man he is. Uh, interesting. And, um, you know, he was right in the, the midst of the whole thing. Yeah, and I, I have to give him credit uh, for a man in his position. Uh, you know, the UFO subject obviously is difficult for us to manage as as citizens, but to be in a position of military authority and to acknowledge, as he did at the time, that we have uh, unidentified objects in our air force that are in our airspace that are beyond our control, and uh, that that's that's a huge statement coming from a man that's supposed to be in control uh, of our airspace and in charge. And um, I, I've been struck by the humility of the, the, the Belgian people, not only uh, General de Brouwer, but also a, a good friend that I've come to know over the years, uh, Mr. Patrick Farron, who is the director of uh, now it's called COBEPS, but at the time it was SOBEPS, the investigative group that basically cataloged all of these sightings. Really? Um, I think I saw something on him. Wasn't there like... Didn't they have like two books or a big, huge books full, or maybe even more than that? Yes, I'm reports? looking at I'm looking at the copies sitting over on my bookshelf right now, actually, and uh, very comprehensive. They've never been uh, translated into English, which one day hopefully we can get those translated for uh, English speaking audiences. Uh, but uh, a fascinating compendium of triangular, but not just triangular UFOs that were being reported at the time, but other shapes and sizes. And some of that factors into the historical research that I've gathered. And uh, in, in point of fact, uh, I'm happy to say that in uh, June, uh, Mr. Patrick Farron will be in the United States and he will be here in Albuquerque and we are planning our first face-to-face -face meeting. So I'm looking forward Excellent. to exchanging information with him face-to-face. Well, excellent. Now, about I'd say about a year, year and a half ago, I did more or less a UFO debate with uh, Roger Nygaard, who is a uh, documentarian or doc uh, or film. Uh, what am I trying to say? Um, <laughs> filmmaker. Um, okay. He did uh, Trekkies and uh, a bunch of different films. And anyway, um, he had his answer for all of the triangle UFOs. He said they were all military that we don't know about, and that. You know, you hear a lot of, uh, do I want to say skeptics or debunkers, either one, but uh, a lot of times they'll bring up that the uh, triangle UFOs are nothing but something military that we don't know about. Uh, what's, your, what's your answer to someone like that? Well, let me just say this, because I've stated this to audiences across the country uh, over the last year, year and a half. Uh, I do not deny that some triangular objects, triangular UFOs, if you will, could be military aircraft. Now, uh, those aren't necessarily the low-flying, extremely large objects that are being seen, you know, flitting over the treetops and power lines uh, across this country and many other countries. But to make it a blanket explanation, to me, speaks to the person's ignorance. And uh, I, I, I don't say that. I don't say that lightly. And the reason I say that, for anyone that's read my book. Uh, these reports go back at least to the late 1800s, and I have numerous accounts of these triangular objects before the advent of powered flight. And uh, I, I think, you know, you can make that argument with regard to the modern day reports, and by that I mean maybe over the last 20, 30 years. Um, but then there's some common sense questions that come into play. 
why are we flying these around all over the world, apparently just for the entertainment of civilians who see them, and yet we have no reports of these being seen over military theater operations? Uh, if we have military aircraft, and Colonel John Alexander that wrote the foreword to my book, he and I agree on this point wholeheartedly, if we had craft that can behave, maneuver, like these objects are reported to do, we would be using them. We would not be resorting to F-117A stealth fighters, B-2 stealth bombers, which, you know, in comparison is, is infantile technology. So if we have this technology, why aren't we using it within military theaters? Uh, we're saving it for something really good, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> for the next big war. Yeah. No, I, I, that makes total sense to me. And if you're going back into the 1800s, um, they can't really argue that. And I was ab absolutely unaware that there were triangular sightings that far back. You know, it seems to me you hear about, of course, um, uh, first was sort of like a, a winged disc. Um, and then the disc, you know, the flying saucer, so to speak, sort of came into fashion as it seemed, uh, mm -hmm. the cigar shape. And then the triangle, it, it seems... Um, to me, you know, I had a discussion, I think it was with Leo Sprinkle just last week, and, you know, perhaps these different crafts, if we're going in the extraterrestrial uh, route um, to say that's what these are, of course, no one really knows for sure. But if we're saying that is the truth, then um, the, they could be from different planets or, um, you know, just next year's model or something. Absolutely. And you bring up a good point. You know, I, I agree with what you just said. You know, we don't know. And uh, it really bothers me when you have, as you mentioned, the skeptics or even many people within the UFO community that are open to UFOs, but they, they make this delineation where, well, the triangles, those are ours. And this is the thing. If you're going to make a statement, you damn well better back it up with facts. And to just arbitrarily throw that comment out there, what is your basis for making that conclusion? And the basis that I made, the historical argument, as I like to say, is, is basically in my book, looking at the history, looking at the consistency of these reports spanning worldwide over decades. Uh, it really stretches the, the believability of this theory that these are some type of top secret military aircraft that, that we're not aware of. And um, unfortunately, a lot of this goes back, and this is kind of a sacred cow that I'm going to be poking here, so I'm pro we're probably going to get a lot of uh, chatter <laughs> as a result of this from the audience. But, uh, you know, people arbitrarily, if you look up triangular UFOs, I, I see it so often, it really irritates me. Uh, they'll state, well, oh, the triangular UFOs, those are just the TR-3B oh, aircraft. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, first it off, let's take it. doesn't really a exist, does it? Well, that's just the point. It, it might. I, I can't sit here and say that it doesn't exist, but that story really goes back to one individual who claims to have worked uh, on inside military projects. And again, you know, for the audience, let's just take a dose of common sense for a minute. In writing my book, I interviewed aerospace engineers from British Aerospace, Boeing, and McDonnell Douglas. And there may be some, some aviation aircraft design engineers out there right now that are listening to this. This one individual, who I won't name because I don't wish to give him any more uh, celebrity or audience than, than he, he's already garnered, mm -hmm. he claims to have worked on this project, but he goes one step further. He says, not only did I work on the project, here's the physics, and here's how the object worked, and here's some detailed schematics of how the object worked. For anyone that has worked in the defense industry... If you are working on a top secret aircraft, or let's just say a component thereof, and you go public with said information, you are going to be arrested, you are going to have your pension revoked, and you are going to be looking at serious jail time. None of this has happened to this individual. <laughs> it's sort of Bob Lazar-like. Well, and, and that's another sacred cow that I'm sorry, I, you know, I'm just pretty blatant. I don't sugarcoat it anymore. Bob Lazar is uh, disinformation as far as I'm concerned, uh, in my opinion. And the reason I say that is, you know, sometimes that, that rubs people the wrong way that have their belief systems hinged on these people and their testimony. But this is, this is what I pose to you. These are the people making the claims. The burden of proof is on them, not me, to tear them down. 
they have made these outrageous claims, but where are their facts? Right, right. Um, I I like you, Dave. I I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I, I, I I I think a lot um, similar to the way you do. I want to tell you a story that is pretty interesting because there's a lot, there's a lot of information that I've had since I started the show on triangular UFOs and encounters with them. Um, and one of them is uh, a listener. I'm not sure if she's listening now. She's in Australia. She said when she was a little girl working in the garden with her mother, all of a sudden this big triangle UFO flew right over them. And and this is something that I haven't heard or maybe I heard it once or twice, but they felt like it was like they were being pressured, like it pushed her right down on the ground, this pressure as it went over. Have you ever mm. heard a story like that? Not involving an individual, but I just was uh, lecturing in Florida for the uh, state MUFON group down there, and uh, a great group, by the way. I have to thank them publicly uh, while, while I'm mentioning that. I had a wonderful time. Uh, but I uh, actually encountered someone who had a sighting uh, several years ago in uh, southern Illinois, which is where I used to reside up until three years ago. And again, I was state, state Illinois MUFON state director for several years there. Uh, his experience involved some type of pressure or downdraft uh, that was affecting uh, a group of trees. Uh, in fact, I'll be interviewing him later this weekend to get more uh, additional details on this. But there are uh, a small percentage of um, situations where there seems to be some effect on the surroundings, especially underneath the object. But the vast majority, uh, usually these objects are seemingly moving through the air without displacement of air, without any electromagnetic effects, although, again, there are some in the, the reports that I've been able to gather. But um, it's, it's very interesting, and, and, and there are variations within the reports. Um, I, I don't like to make it sound like every, every account fits a pattern. There, there are certainly variations in the reports. But, you know, admittedly, sometimes that may be due not so much to the UFO being observed, but the UFO observer, their, you know, their lack of visual acuity, maybe their lack of, you know, auditory, you know, uh, ability to hear the object. Uh, obviously, the wind blowing in the opposite direction, if there was a slight sound that may inhibit or attenuate the ability to, you know, hear that, that sound. So there are variations in the reports. I don't want to make it sound like it's one homogeneous body of sighting reports. Um, and sometimes it's interesting, you know, you look for patterns, you look for consistencies, but I think equally interesting as a researcher, it's interesting to find those that don't fit the pattern, those, those outliers where I have no other case that reports that. Isn't that interesting? Shouldn't we explore that a little bit further? There's actually one from 1957, which hopefully we can touch on maybe later, uh, where there was a, a, an unusual case that just didn't seem to fit the overall pattern that was in an air intelligence report in Project Blue Book. Oh, why don't we just go right into that right now? Because I, I do have some questions on the chat room, but... Why don't you just uh, describe that particular story? Okay. Well, uh, you know, a ser besides the uh, newspaper articles and the newspaper archives I went through, I, I did a comprehensive review of all the declassified UFO MOD files as well as Air Force Project Blue Book files looking for triangular reports. And uh, there were quite a few in, in, in all of these different areas. And uh, I sifted through them. I tried to find the best, the most well-documented uh, you know, even some involving radar confirmation in addition to multiple eyewitness accounts. Uh, but in 1957, November of 1957, I found what appears to be a global wave of triangular UFO sightings. Now, I know this may sound strange to those that are, you know, familiar to hearing these accounts in the 80s and the 90s. This was 1957. And uh, November of 1957, the Belgian... Uh, uh, defense Intelligence, or I'm sorry, Danish uh, Defense Intelligence Service uh, was investigating a wave of triangular spaceships. That was their term, not mine at the time in the newspapers. Triangular spaceships that were being reported and investigated. Uh, numerous accounts. I also found a Reuters news article that corroborated that and discussed in detail uh, a particular sighting. But as those accounts were occurring in, uh, in Denmark, over in Illinois, 
there were two sightings, Illinois, one in Illinois, one in Wisconsin on the same night involving a 200-foot triangular object. And while all of this is going on, within a week's period of time, there was a uh, uh, intelligence report in Project Blue Book involving two fishermen that were uh, in Sumatra, Indonesia, that observed this large triangular object move over their fishing boat. And it described that there were these uh, lights on each point, and there was smoke billowing out of each point. And that was, I've never, ever heard of any type of emission like that. And I, you know, sheer speculation on my part, but I speculated, was this a rare instance of one of these objects in some type of mechanical distress? But I think it's worthy to note that Air Force intelligence officers deemed it credible enough, and again, probably in the context of these other reports they were receiving worldwide, to actually file an air intelligence report documenting this and then making it part of Air Force Project Blue Book files. Wow, that is amazing. So we have a question, a couple of questions up on the message board, and one is a lot of times you hear about these craft fl- flying very uh, low altitudes right over the treetops, as you said, you know, a lot of times you'll hear the description like a football field size or something like that. Yes. But are they ever observed at higher altitudes? Uh, they are. Uh, again, fairly rare in, in in the general scheme of reporting that I've been able to document. Uh, the uh, Chilean Air Force in 1980 actually had two incidents uh, where uh, the uh, triangular UFOs were being uh, tracked on radar and uh, jet interceptors were sent up to identify and possibly intercept these UFOs. Uh, And the pilot, uh, uh, Captain Danilo uh, Catalan Farias, uh, was able to establish visual contact with one of the objects, which he described as large, dark, and triangular. But these were high-altitude sightings, and apparently the objects were uh, departing as a result of the jet's closing in on them, you know, during this attempted uh, identification and or intercept. Uh, There are other accounts uh, of uh, relatively high altitude triangular UFOs. Now, just just to make a little point here, uh, in in examining these reports, I don't accept every report at face value. And regarding high altitude sightings in 1966, there was a, uh, a report of a triangular UFO that garnered worldwide media attention. I have uh, many original newspaper clippings with a photo of said triangular UFO. But later it was determined, it estimated that what this was was actually a high-altitude balloon, which when viewed from directly below had the shape of a triangle. But in fact, it was more of an inverted pyramid. And uh, there's a French research balloon that was also... Uh, an explanation for a uh, triangular UFO sighting in uh, Riga, Latvia, that was in the Soviet UFO files, and they were able to film that. And in that particular instance, it was high-altitude triangular, but it also was uh, semi-transparent and somewhat reflective. And the uh, investigators ultimately determined it must have been a high-altitude French research uh, balloon. And so, you know, when I come across these reports, I try to do a fair, fairly good job of vetting the reports mm-hmm. and separating the wheat from the chaff, you know, in, in putting these cases together in my book. Now, a lot of times you will hear what you just mentioned. It's sort of like a translucent. And uh, also, um, let's, for instance, the Phoenix lights, you hear about these sort of um, orbs that are underneath them, sort of like a really unique color glowing. Uh, Do a lot of these triangles have that? They do, uh, but I will say this. uh, Of all the common uh, patterns, the common consistencies, characteristics that I've found with the triangles, uh, what you're touching on, the lighting patterns, that seems to be the most variable. And I don't know really how to explain that. Again, you know, Martin, we we have more questions than answers with regard to these, uh, these objects. But um, I I do tend to lean towards the idea, and I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm certainly not sold on the idea. But, you know, at some point we have to, you know, separate ourselves from all the facts we're gathering. And at some point, as a researcher, you have to speculate a little bit. I try not to go down that slippery slope too much. But I think that these lights, due to the shifting patterns, due to the variability, that the lights may in fact be some inherent 
part of the propulsion system. And based on maneuvering, based on acceleration, deceleration, etc., that we're probably seeing variable lights displayed as a direct result of the propulsion system that's involved in propelling these objects. But yes, Phoenix Lights was certainly interesting. Um, interesting thing about that is many of the uh, accounts uh, back in, in 1997, they described as the object went overhead, they could see these lights that were recessed. And I think that's an important, important point to bring out that uh, these aren't just simply lights floating around. And certainly, you know, I, I tried to weed through re- accounts in the Blue Book files and Ministry of Defense files where people simply saw three points of light. Because let's be honest, Martin, that could be just that. It could be three separate independent light sources just flying in a triangular formation. But like the Phoenix Lights case, where you have multiple witnesses describing these lights apparently affixed to to some solid, rigid platform that blocked out the stars as it moved overhead. I think we need to take a step back and look at those accounts a little bit more critically and try to evaluate what are we dealing with here. Right, right. Another, pardon me, another question up on the board here. Um, If you're considering, just to consider the extraterrestrial hypotheses, um, which alien race is associated with triangles? Has have you ever heard of that? You know, like the Greys, Nordics, Reptilians, or something like that. Has anyone ever associated a being with a triangle? They have. Now, l- l- let me preface this by saying that I haven't personally come across in any any credible accounts that I would be willing to you know discuss. But uh, a a dear uh, colleague of mine in the UK, Mr. Omar Fowler, who I always like to pay credit to. Uh, years ago, wrote two small monographs on the triangular UFO mystery, which he's extensively investigated in the UK. And um, I wanted him to be part of my book because really it was his work that served as kind of a, uh, a precursor to me deciding to go ahead and you know take the information that he documented and really try to expand on it uh, even further. And uh, in, in my book, Mr. Omar Fowler recounts one or two instances involving uh, apparently an abduction scenario, alien abduction scenario, associated with a triangular UFO. Now, I've had a lot of people tell me during lectures, you know, have you investigated the abduction mystery and the aliens in reference to triangles? I said, well, up to this point, you have to appreciate mine was more of a historical endeavor. And when you're looking at newspaper accounts from the the late 40s, the early 50s, and certainly even accounts going back to the late 1800s, that was not discussed at the time. It wasn't written about. So just by virtue of the fact I was focusing on older cases, I just didn't come across that. Now, certainly on the Internet, there's many claims, many stories of alien abduction and triangular UFOs. Uh, I just I just really can't speak to that just simply because I haven't really devoted a lot of research into that particular area. Sure, uh, that that makes total sense um, to me. Now, um, someone else on the message board wanted to know: Have you ever seen? Uh, I'm not you personally, but have you ever heard of sightings um, of different types of crafts along with triangle UFOs? And while we're going there, how about multiple triangle UFOs at the same time? Oh, two two great questions. I'm glad you asked me those, Martin. Um, well, let me let me ask let me answer the second question first. Um, while I was down in Florida, uh, I, I met a gentleman and his wife who uh, had in uh, April of last year, uh, April of uh, 2014, had observed nine triangular objects, one after the other, flying low altitude over their property. And this wow. involved uh, at least two neighbors and possibly involves uh, some of these objects being photographed or filmed. And uh, this is another interview that I'll be conducting this weekend to get additional information. But I sat and, and spoke with the man, and I'll be speaking with his wife as well. And uh, it, this has been investigated by MUFON, and uh, I'm, I'm certainly going to be interviewing all of the witnesses involved. But that is just one example, uh, a fairly recent example, of multiple triangular UFOs being sighted. And if, what I am finding is that a vast majority 
of these triangular reports typically involve at least two triangular UFOs. On the evening of March 29th, 1989, over the Lagalepe Dam and near the village of Upan, uh, the, there were two gendarmes uh, who had observed initially a large triangular platform hovering over a field. Uh, they then watched it move over the Lagalepe Dam, and as they observed it for several minutes, suddenly another triangular UFO that matched its appearance came up over a hill, over a rise of trees, and they observed two triangular UFOs. Now, going through the historical record, I found numerous accounts involving multiple triangular UFOs, and uh, some even in the military files, which is extremely interesting. Uh, In the UK, they've had a number of such reports, and in uh, 1949, over Maryland, there was a daylight sighting by multiple witnesses that was interviewed and investigated by uh, Air Force investigators at the time, and uh, it involved a daylight sighting of at least 12 to 15 triangular UFOs. And it's interesting that Air Force investigators were uh, very open to the, the testimony of this individual who was a former Air Force tech sergeant, and Air Force investigators also interviewed his neighbors down the entire city block who had stepped outside to observe the spectacle. This was actually uh, one that uh, one of the producers for uh, a documentary I just uh, just worked on last year, which is going to be airing here in the States this spring. Uh, the producer who read my book was very interested in that report, and it was well documented. And there's another one that, that they're also going to feature besides that case in, in the episode, and this involved an F-86 Sabrejet pilot over Albany, Georgia in 1953, who observed a very distinct sharp white light, which caught his attention because it just seemed to have a very sharply defined edge to it compared to stars or planets that have that scintillation and twinkling. And he thought, well, I'll increase my altitude, and if the object gets larger, then obviously it's something within the atmosphere. If it doesn't change perspective, it must be a star or a planet. As he did so, within a matter of minutes, he realized that the light that was above him was now beneath him, which immediately ruled out any type of astronomical explanation. And as he then began to descend and approach the object, the light changed into an equilateral triangle, which then divided into two triangles, and then they immediately disappeared. So, yes, we have accounts of multiple triangular UFOs. And um, so we we have that, and they have also been cited, uh, to your first question, with other UFOs. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this in, in the second hour when we talk about the January 5th uh, incident. But suffice it to say that the SOBEPS investigators in Belgium, as well as elsewhere, uh, have investigated these triangular UFOs being seen with other shaped UFOs, specifically rectangular UFOs. On uh, that evening of March 29th that I mentioned, uh, 1989, the dispatcher Albert Kreutz at the Upon police station stepped out on his balcony and observed a triangular UFO float off in the distance. It was quickly replaced by a rectangular UFO with bright lights at each corner. Now, uh, in my lectures that I do across the country, I show his sketch, and then I do a side-by-side comparison of a sketch that was drawn uh, five years previously by a witness in uh, New York, the state of New York. And this was a housewife and her daughter coming back from the grocery store who uh, observed, this was in the APRO files, uh, observed a triangular UFO which disappeared behind the trees. And then shortly thereafter, it was replaced with a rectangular UFO with four bright lights, one at each corner. And when you do the sketches side by side, they're virtually identical. Amazing. Um, one of the things, that, uh, a couple of times I've heard this situation, one is Rendlesham Forest and yes. another incident. Um, a, a friend of mine cited this years ago in Massachusetts where an, an object actually burst into lights. Uh, is that something you've heard more than those, you know, just a few times? Um, as far as the triangle b- bursting into light? Yeah, or changing. Uh, you mentioned just a minute ago that one divided or something. Yes, uh, we have accounts of triangular UFOs merging 
In other words, two triangular UFOs merging into one. We also have accounts, as I mentioned, with the 1953 Albany, Georgia case of triangles dividing. Now, to even stretch the imagination even further, we have accounts of UFOs, triangular UFOs, that appear to morph or change shape right in front of the eyewitness. We have a famous case from 1954, a uh, British overseas airway cruiser case, and this was uh, known as the Flying Jellyfish case. Huh. And uh, the uh, pilot, uh, uh, Captain Howard, was flying from New York to uh, over Labrador and had observed this uh, triangular UFO with smaller attendant objects that were flying alongside it. It kept pace with their plane, essentially the same altitude. Uh, the crew observed this for about 18 minutes. Uh, the uh, the passengers observed it as well. And at one point, Captain Howard's attention was distracted. And when he looked back, he asked, uh, I believe it was Lee Boyd, the navigator on the plane, where did the smaller objects disappear to? And he he replied to Captain Howard, well, it appears that the smaller objects went into the large one. And then they observed this large object shifting, morphing, changing shape. And this was well documented. I have some of the original uh, uh, British and uh, American newspapers from 1954 that chronicle this and have sketches uh, from Captain Howard and some of the crew. Um, now, that's a situation where the ob we have smaller attendant objects going into the triangular craft. Um, going back to the, the Danish wave of 1957 that I referred to earlier, the Reuters news article that I found references the uh, Danish village of Brohjur in which a woman reportedly saw a large, dark, silent, triangular object, low altitude. Now, doesn't that sound very, very similar to modern-day accounts? And she described that as she observed the object hovering silently, Smaller horseshoe-shaped objects, each emitting a strong light, came out of the larger triangular object. Now, this is Reuters news service that ran the story in 1958. Uh, what is of interest is that uh, the, news, uh, the news reporters found at least 20 other villagers that corroborated the woman's testimony. Wow, amazing. Um, now... Would you consider the triangular sightings on the rise compared to other shaped crafts? Absolutely. Matter of fact, uh, I, at the beginning of my book, I, I, you know, we, we can talk about frequency, we can talk about increasing sightings, but I, I really like to try to put some numbers to it. And as you can appreciate, we have different series of statistics that exist within the UFO field. But in 2004, during an early stage of my investigation and in trying to start looking at patterns in the historical record regarding these objects, I decided to uh, check my, my dear friend and colleague Peter Davenport at the National UFO Reporting Center and check the statistics that they had posted at the time. And in uh, November of 2004, I was looking at the uh, breakdown of objects reported based on shape or based on description. And I was amazed to find that the Category designated as light, um, uh, just light in the sky or a report of a light, they had 5,509 reports on file. Now, I think we'll all agree, any conservative investigator out there will agree, that could be Venus, that could be a satellite. It's, it's a pretty vague description when you just see a light in the nighttime sky. Mm -hmm. But 5,509 reports of lights. The second runner-up in 2004 was Triangle. 2,782 reports, and when I do my lectures, I always like to compare that to the discs, flying discs that were reported, 2,439. So flying discs are, uh, you know, basically coming in third, uh, you know, after triangular UFOs. And I thought, well, that was interesting, and that's, that's some numbers that at least we can look at. And admittedly, those are raw reports. All of those have not been vetted and investigated necessarily, but it at least gives us an idea of what are people reporting, regardless of the legitimacy or the veracity of the, the reports. Well, in 2012, I was doing another lecture, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to revisit those statistics just to see if the, the same pattern tends to play out. And uh, now keep in mind, these, this is a cumulative total. But in February 2012, the category of light, there was 13,997 reports. 
Second to that was the category of triangle, 6,957. And again, the category of disc was 5,288. So we do seem to see an increase in frequency of these triangular UFOs being reported. And I will concede that that might be due to the fact that some of these triangles being reported could be military aircraft. But I don't like to talk in absolutes. I don't like to say all or none, as some of the uh, skeptics like to do. Uh, But I do think that some of these triangular UFOs might be military. But when you look at the history, when you look at the consistency, and you compare modern reports to these early reports, uh, I think we at least need to maintain an open mind regarding the subject that these may not necessarily be manufactured here on Earth. Now, do you actually see uh, more of a concentration in any certain country like Canada or the United States over, say, um, a European nation? Well, uh, I certainly have a lot of accounts from the United States. I have a lot of reports from the U.K., but I'm always very quick to add that I think part of the problem, and, and I do call it a problem, not just triangular UFO research, but UFO research in general, is, as you can appreciate, a simple language barrier. Uh, I'm sure that we have some South American reports that we're just not hearing about because they may have only been you know, published in um, you know, Portuguese or Spanish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I was just talking to a, a friend and researcher out in California, Mr. Ted Bonnet, and uh, he was asking me about reports from China. And really, when you look on the Internet, we don't see a lot of reports yet. When you look at the country, when you look at the country of China, I mean, my God, how many eyewitnesses do you have? Um, but we have language barriers, obviously, that come into play. And uh, if we could break down those those language barriers, I think we'd be surprised and shocked at the volume of reports. And wouldn't it be nice if we could have an international gathering of UFO case files where we could put it into a centralized database? And then we could really start looking at frequencies and statistics. But until then, I'm afraid we're still faced with some language barriers, which is why primarily I have accounts from the United States and uh, the U.K. We had a correspondent for a while there in China, but uh, his email keeps bouncing. and (laughs) He was actually on the show (laughs) once a month. Um, Now, a question up on the message board, and I think it's a pretty good one. Are any um, reports of these... As USOs, you know, underwater? Yes. Wow. Can um, you talk a little about that? Well, I, I, I'm familiar with, the, you know, USOs in general, but I don't have any accounts of these triangular UFOs being sighted underwater or emerging from water, uh, which is interesting because certainly we do have other UFOs reportedly uh, in association with water or coming in or out of water. Uh, one thing I would like to add to that, though, and again, it's interesting to see what the reports reflect. It's also interesting to see what, what you don't find in the reports. And I'm really amazed that after just culling through hundreds, literally hundreds of these triangular UFO reports over the last several decades, I have not been able to find one credible, and I emphasize that I've heard some, some rather curious accounts, but I really don't deem them as credible. But I don't have one credible account of a triangular UFO landing, touching ground, or taking off, wow. which is interesting. Well, well, you know, the, the one in Rendlesham Forest, I know that was a small one, but uh, it was purported to, you know, land on the ground with those uh, tripod marks. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that, that is the one example, and, and certainly, uh, let, let me be very clear, I, I, I would not consider that a non-credible case. I certainly do find that a very credible case. But I'm hesitant to put it into the category. Uh, I do mention it in my book, by the way, just in passing. But I don't necessarily put it into the category of these large-scale triangular oh, UFOs. Sure. Uh, but you, you bring up a very good point, Martin, that that was a very good case. And certainly that was described and discussed and, and well-documented at the time. But as far as these large objects are concerned... Um, we just simply have no credible accounts of these things landing or taking off, leaving scorched marks or depressed vegetation. Uh, again, like we did, you know, several decades ago with the flying saucer reports, where we had a, a number of those, you know, that have been investigated by uh, Mr. Ted Phillips over the last several decades. Right. Um, there was a MUFON investigator that 
was on our show. You may have, you may even know her, uh, Chase Klotsky. I know of her. We've never had the opportunity to meet, unfortunately. Well, she has quite a story about a triangle craft. Um, she went down to investigate and basically tell this person, I believe it was Tennessee, tell this person that what they were seeing was, you know, something else. She went down there to try to more or less debunk what he was seeing. And, you know, he was saying that they're back or whatever. And um, all of a sudden, this big, huge thing, you know, she saw it coming and went right over them, you know, yeah. all standing there together. And that really changed her mind. Oh, absolutely. I, I was uh, last last year, um, I was at the International UFO Congress where I spoke and uh, I had a chance to, to sit and chat with Mr. Lee Spiegel from the Huffington Post. And uh, mm -hmm. Lee, Lee was very happy with my book and uh, very happy that I talked about the um, the uh, Lumberton, North Carolina wave back in 1975. And uh, he said, well, he goes, you know, I went down there and investigated that. I said, well, yeah, I was, I was familiar. I was reading the reports. He said, yeah, but I also saw the object. And it was a similar situation where he went out with some law enforcement officers into a, a near a field where they had seen an object just days earlier. And as they were standing there, they saw these lights off in the distance that slowly started moving towards them. And as the object literally came overhead, uh, the object shone a beam of light down on the squad car, the surrounding area, and Lee and all of these uh, police officers that were with him at the time. And um, so it's one of those rare instances, as I always like to mention when I, when I cite that case, that that's one of those rare situations like, like Chase, where you go down as an investigator and you suddenly become a participant. Right. Well, uh, Colonel Charles Halt, he went out there to, you know, more or less tell these guys they were crazy. And then, he, yeah. you know, changed his life totally. Well, I, I hope, Martin, eventually I can put myself in that category because I, despite all my academic interest in the subject, I have yet to see one, but I certainly hope one day I will. Well, we certainly need people like you out there doing the investigation, someone to make it more credible than, uh, well, just just your presentation and your thoughts. I think it really is pretty solid, and I'm glad you're, you're doing this. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left before the top of the hour. And um, no messages flowing in right now, so I just want to um, ask uh, one more thing, and that is um, a lot of times you hear about these going, you know, very slow over houses or fields or whatever it is. Has there yes. ever been any interrupted cars? You know, sometimes you hear about cars stalling out and then restarting afterwards. Have you ever heard of anything like that with triangles? Uh, not so not so much with vehicle interference, but uh, one of the characteristics which I, I list, I have primary characteristics and secondary characteristics. One of the secondary characteristics is, in fact, electromagnetic interference, uh, apparent electromagnetic interference. And uh, I haven't really found any vehicle interference cases, uh, although I do, I must add that I do have numerous accounts of these triangular UFOs hovering over vehicles that are trying to basically escape. And as the vehicle increased in speed, the triangular UFO increased in speed and kept with the individuals. I have a number of people I've interviewed here in the States as well as over in the UK that had similar instances, but uh, none that involved vehicle interference, but there are some that are in the files where there do appear to be some type of electromagnetic interference. Um, there was one, in fact, uh, again, reported by APRO, and this one occurred in November of 1982 in California. And the couple was actually camping. They were in their tent, and they heard this humming or buzzing sound. And they felt like there was, like, this extreme static electricity, like there was a sharp prickling feeling all over their arms and their body. And as they exited the, uh, the tent, they saw this huge manta ray-shaped triangular, essentially, UFO hovering low altitude over them. And then there was another instance in Japan, the only one I have from Japan, courtesy of Mr. Omar Fowler, involving a wedding coordinator who was actually setting up for a wedding reception and saw this triangular UFO fly overhead. And uh, investigators were able to document that in the surrounding area, a number of people had radio interference at the time. Interesting. Well, we have just one more question I'm going to throw at you. And... That is, have you ever seen a really, really good picture of one of these or a really, really good video? Um, I Well, <laughs> that's a hard one to answer, and I'll try to answer it as accurately as I can. 
obviously, for anyone that searches the Internet or goes on YouTube, you're going to see some really interesting videos and really interesting photos of these triangular UFOs. Unfortunately, CGI. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, Martin. Uh, they're, they look real. They certainly look convincing. But, you know, when you've had video analysts tear them apart, it, it turns out that it's actually CGI uh, and uh, other hoaxes. Uh, there was actually one that I used talking. It was a video that was filmed in Florida. And like I said, I was recently speaking there, and th I show this video that I pulled off of YouTube that was filmed by a news affiliate in Florida a few years back, and I use it to illustrate the fact that all the video shows is three points of white light in a triangular configuration with a strobing red light in the center, but there's no objects in the foreground, no objects in the background. I said, this could be a 200-foot uh, triangular UFO hovering over a cornfield. It could also be a three-inch model suspended over your bed on fishing wire in a completely darkened room. I said, we simply don't know. Uh -huh. So we need to be very careful with photos and with video. Uh, I have not seen any that have been you know, truly substantiated. But really, photos and video, to me, are one of the weakest forms of evidence, if I can use that word. I'm more interested in multiple witness sightings that are corroborated by radar. I think those are the more compelling because obviously radar is a little bit harder to fabricate or hoax. Yeah, but you'll hear the debunking about that. But that's oh, yes. just the way it is. <laughs> so that's it for Hour 1. If you'd like to listen to Hour 2, you can subscribe for a dollar a month or more. That information is right on our website, podcastufo.com. I want to thank everyone for helping out with the show today. Ryan Sprague at the beginning. Then we had our guest, of course, David Marler. I want to thank Peggy Lloyd Whitehouse for managing our Facebook page. Remember, you can like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO news. Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for our music. And next week, our guest will be Ray Stanford. And the two-hour show will be pre-recorded. I believe Alejandro Rojas will be there for the news ahead of time. And so that's it. If you want to listen to the whole show for free, you can listen live right here on the Dark Matter Radio Network. And we'll be back next week at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Martin Willis saying keep your eyes to the sky.